Hebrews chapter 9. So we are continuing in this big section. I won't go through all of the details again, but uh, our focus, the focus of our attention has been chapter 5, verse 1 through chapter 10, verse 18. And we're now in the second half of that, which began in chapter 8. Uh, it was last week, I guess. And goes, so chapter 8, verse 1, all the way to the end of this section, which is 10, 18. So here in this section that we are looking at, the focus of the author is how that Jesus is the better or the superior high priest because he is a heavenly high priest and this whole thing is, is unpacking why he is better than what was previously available in the earthly role of the high priest. So last week um, in chapter 8, we discussed um, the reason that the old covenant needed to be replaced by the new covenant. That was the entirety of chapter 8. If you just look at verse 7 of chapter 8, this kind of sums it up. If that first covenant had been without fault, then no place would have been sought for a second. So it's a real easy, if the first one had done what needed to be done, there would be no need for a second. And obviously the whole point of the covenant would be to change people's lives, bring them into relationship with Christ, perfect them, mature them, but the old covenant was powerless to do that. The old covenant, uh, the illustration I gave you was like a, a doctor that can say you're sick, but I don't know how to help you. That's all the old covenant did. And so last week we learned, and it's pretty simple, pretty elementary, but we learned that because it couldn't do what needed to be done, there was a need for a new covenant. The old covenant could not change or transform hearts. So now the subject is going to turn to um, particular ways that the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins is better than the sacrifice the Old Testament priest made. Um, let me just stop for a minute and say, I know that um, we all, because we have years of being taught this, none of us even for a moment think that a ram's blood would forgive us. So we get the point. If you just want to be about getting the point, it's almost like, why do we even study this? Because we all know that the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us. So we know that. I'm not trying to teach you that. You already know that. What we're trying to do in understanding Hebrews is the why. Why, why was this such a big deal? And then there are implications for us that help us if we can understand. And I, I, let, let me say this. It's not in my notes. I think even more importantly for Christians in 2022, in this new era, and I'm just, I guess, new Christians in the New Testament in general, it's not, it's not so much that we need to understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses us and the blood of rams didn't. But when we understand that reality, it should deepen our worship. When we understand how lost we are without Christ and we understand how available the presence of God is to us today, most, I, I said this last Wednesday evening, I don't think I said it in the morning, but, but the truth is most Christians today live like old covenant Christians. We, uh, they went year to year and they just survived year to year on the Day of Atonement. Most Christians in 2022 go Sunday to Sunday. And it's just like I'm back in church, so now I can feel God again. And then it'll push me through. I mean, how many times do we say or do you see on Facebook, I really needed my Sunday pickup so I can make it, you know, another week. That's living like an old covenant Christian. And so obviously we haven't gotten it. Even though we know the blood of Jesus cleanses us and the ram's blood didn't, most Christians in 2020, I'm talking about Christians that fill churches, are not accessing the presence of Jesus daily and, and enjoying the benefits of the new covenant. We're living like old covenant Christians, 
and we come to church and hope the people around us and the preacher will say some kind of blessing and we'll feel better till the next week. That's just an old covenant Christian all dressed up um, in a different in a different garb. So this is important because obviously the church has not applied what Jesus did fully for them. So that's why we're dealing with this. So letter B then, we are going to look at why the son's sacrifice for sins is better than the offerings that were made in the Old Testament by the priest. So in this section that we are looking at today, from here to the end of uh, May, we have we have four more Wednesdays. We are going to cover 9-1, chapter 9 and verse 1, through chapter 10 and verse 18. Today, as you can see, C1, this is what we're going to look at today. And that's why you have a map. We're going to look at the Old Covenant Sanctuary. What, what was the Old Covenant Sanctuary or tabernacle like? And how does that, what is the, why is the new better? And then next week, we will look at the decisive, I'm excited about this lesson, it's really good, the decisive um, cleansing that we get through the blood of Jesus. It's complete. It really washes us clean. And we're going to talk about, it's not a cover-up for the next time. It is a decisive cleansing. And we will look at that next week. And then we will take the last two weeks of May um, to talk about the perfect and the consummate sacrifice of Jesus. That's chapter 10 and those 18 verses. We'll break that down into two weeks. Let me give you three, and this is really kind of looking ahead, but they all kind of intermingle three ways or three grounds upon which the sacrifice of Jesus was better than the old. Number one, um, the place of the offering was in heaven, not on earth. The, the blood of Jesus was offered in the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary. We will talk about that uh, at length over the next couple of weeks. Secondly, the blood was his own blood, not the blood of an animal. That's, that's a second way that his sacrifice stands out. And thirdly, the offering made by the heavenly high priest, Jesus, was eternal once and for all, not like the offerings of the earthly priest that had to be repeated over and over and over. All of those things will kind of come to the fore over the next um, two or three Wednesday. So the section before us today, chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, it has a pretty narrow focus. Um, it is the tabernacle and the provisions for worship in that tabernacle. Look at chapter 8 and verse 13. Um, 813, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Look at chapter 9 and verse 1. Then indeed the first covenant. So again, that is kind of our uh, pointer. What we are talking about is the first, the old covenant, and the old covenant tabernacle or sanctuary. Verse 1 introduces the subject. Look at verse 1 again. Then indeed even the first covenant, look, had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So there are two things that are that are going to be talked about today in these 10 verses. The divine ordinances, those are the regulations for worship. What were the regulations of the Old Testament worship system? Divine ordinances. And the second thing is the earthly tabernacle. In verses 2, four, two 3, 4, and 5, we'll talk about the arrangement of the tabernacle. And then verses 6 through 10, we'll talk about the ordinances of or regulations for worship. So um, you have a handout. You have a uh, tabernacle. Do you all have a tabernacle uh, on a handout there, I believe? And uh, we will be looking at that as we go. If you were not aware of um, how the tabernacle was laid out, you have something to look at. So let's go back again. I'm going to read verse 1 one more time. Um, 
we've already read it twice, but here's a third time. Then indeed the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So ordinances of divine service just simply means it had regulations for worship. Priest had to do this first, do this next, this kind of blood, this kind of animal, this kind of cleansing, this kind of washing, all of that. The, the old covenant had regulations for worship. That's, that's the simple part. And the other half is it had an earthly sanctuary. The Greek word, and I put it in your notes, for earthly is cosmicon. And um, you can see the word cosmos in that, all right? Um, cosmicon just simply means it is it belongs to the earth. It was something that, that belonged here. It had an earthly, of the earth sanctuary. Now, this word doesn't just mean, and this is important, I think, it doesn't mean just that it belonged to the earth, all right? That, that's one sense of it. doesn't mean that it just was located. What I meant to say is it doesn't mean it was just located on the earth. It means that the earthly sanctuary belonged to the earth. It was made of earthly substance. There was nothing divine about it. It was made with hands. It was earthly. It wasn't just that its location was on the earth. It was of earthly substance. Um, in uh, Look at chapter 8 and verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So the difference between the heavenly tabernacle and the earthly one was that the earthly one belonged to earth. It was made by man. It was made of, of earthly things, and, and it was also obviously located on earth. If you look at chapter 9 and verse 24, this is kind of what it is anticipating. It says, this is what we'll get to probably next week, Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true, but in heaven itself. So again, earthly, I just want you to get this, earthly is a sanctuary that belongs to the earth. It was made with the hands of humans, it used human or earthly substance, and it was located on the earth. So we are talking about that Old Testament tabernacle. Um, an earthly sanctuary is not only temporary, and it was, but it's imperfect. Anything, uh, you, you all... Think about this, um, and I'll, I'll make the connection if it doesn't immediately connect with you. But Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. The, the point is that anything here, any substance here, it corrodes. It, it gets old. Anything you have, I mean, no matter what you do to preserve it, it, it gets old. The sanctuary on earth that the Jews worshipped in was made with stuff that was temporary. It was fleeting. It was decaying. And, and so it was a picture of the fact that this can't be what is going to be forever because it won't last forever. It will not last for eternity, all right? I, I know I'm maybe overstating the case, but that's what verse 1 is all about. The, the earthly tabernacle was just merely a shadow of the true tabernacle that was to come. Now, go to chapter 9 and verse 2. Um, so he describes the wilderness tabernacle in some detail here. In verse 2, for a tabernacle was prepared... The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So if you pull out your, um, pull out your tabernacle map or um, whatever, um, diagram, and you will notice that we're really, we're going to focus our attention because that's what Hebrews does on just two compartments, the holy place, the first compartment, 
and the most holy place we often call the holy of holies, all right? So this is what is being described here. So first of all, in verse 2, the tabernacle was prepared, the first part. So we're looking at the holy place. And in that first part was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So you, you will see in that diagram, there are three uh, pieces that are shown on the diagram. We'll talk about the Alder Vincents in a moment. It's uh, sort of even controversial, and I'll explain. But let's focus our attention on the two things listed in verse 2, the candlestick um, or the lampstand and the table of showbread. Uh, so let's talk about the first room. I, I want you to hold your finger in Hebrews because I want you to read this scripture. Go back to Exodus 25, if you would. Exodus 25, and um, this is when God is describing how Moses was to build this thing. And this is, he'd build it according to the pattern. Exodus 25, and look at verse number 31. Exodus 25, 31. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The uh, lampstand shall be hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. Six branches have come out of its side, three branches of lamps down out of one and three out of the other. Three bowls will be made like almond blossoms on the branch, an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower, and there will be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches, knob under the third two, according to the six branches. Their knobs and their branches shall be one piece, not supposed to be put together, it's one piece, shall be of one hammered piece of pure gold. You'll make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it, and its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold, shall be made of a talent of pure gold all with all these utensils, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. All right, a couple of things here, just sidebars. First of all, um, this is not the place for that study, but many have done, and I did it years ago, a study of the tabernacle and all of the pieces of furniture and how everything was made. And there's a lot of typology, if you know what I mean by top typology. A lot of this pictures Christ and the purity and all of that. That's not what Hebrews really is doing. Hebrews is showing you the big picture. So we're not going to do that because you could, we could take those nine verses and do typology and spend three weeks on those nine verses, and we're not going to do that. All right, so just kind of giving you a picture. This is how God said to make the lampstand. You will notice that the lampstand, if you look at your map, is on the south side of that compartment, the first compartment, that is called the holy place. Now, opposite of that, on the north side is the table and the bread or the table of showbread. If you stay in Exodus 25, we're going to move up a little bit. Look at verse 23. Verse 23, this is what God says to Moses, make a table of Achaia wood, two cubits in length, cubit in width, cubit and a half its height, Overlay it with pure gold, make a molding of gold all around, make a frame for it out of the hand breadth of all around, and you will make a gold molding for the frame all around. You'll make it for four, you shall make it for four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holder for the poles to bear the table. So when they carried the table, they would bear it on poles that would go through those rings. So when the tabernacle would move, when the cloud would move and God would say, got to move the tabernacle, they would carry it that way. Um, and you, verse 29, you'll make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, its bowls for pouring. You'll make them of pure gold. And then you'll set, verse 30, you'll set the showbread on the table before me always. So they had to always replace that. We'll read a little bit about that 
in just a moment. If you turn to Leviticus, as a matter of fact, we'll read it now. Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. So on that table, they were to place bread. Um, look at verse 5. Leviticus 24, verse 5. You'll take the fine, take fine flour, bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You'll set them in two rows, six in a row, and on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, and it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant, and it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. So inside the first compartment, you have on the south side the, the uh, candlestick, uh, the brazen candle, uh, the lampstand, whatever you want to call it. And then on the other side, on the north side, you have the table of showbread. And every Sabbath, they were to replace the bread, two rows of six. And that was to be perpetually on there. And um, that was part of the divine regulations, if you will, of the Old Testament um, tabernacle. So that is your first compartment, the holy place. We'll talk about what goes on in there in just a moment. Right now we're just laying out, the writer of Hebrews is just laying out the sanctuary. So if you held your finger like I asked you to and I didn't do, Hebrews chapter 9, um, I never remember to do that. I tell everybody else to do it and then I have to find it again. Hebrews 9, let's go back then to um, verse number three. So in verse two, in the first part, we just talked about that, the lamb stand the table to show bread. And then look at verse three, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. All right. So if you're looking at your diagram, there is a veil that separates. It's actually the second veil. There's actually a veil that separates. If you see where my finger is, there's a veil that separates the court from the holy place. And then there's a second veil that separates the holy place from the holiest of all. That is the holy of holies, all right? So verse 3 just simply says there is this behind the second veil the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. And then the furniture for that is listed in verse 4. In the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now, just let me, I know this is, it's either fun and riveting or just a killer boring. I don't know which it is, and it's probably both to some of you, but it's scripture, so we need to try to understand it. So let, let me try to map this out. So you have the, the golden lampstand and the table of showbread. We know for sure are in the holy place. Then there's a veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. Matter of fact, um, if you'll hold your finger in Hebrews 9 and go back to Exodus 26, um, Exodus 26 this time, and look at verse number, we're not going to do this all morning. I just want to set up the sanctuary for you. Exodus 26 and verse number 31 Verse 31, you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it up on the four pillars of Achaia wood overlaid with gold. 
Their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver. You shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The ark of the testimony is the ark of the covenant. Same thing. The veil shall be a divider for you between, look, the holy place and the most holy. All right? So that's what divides those two sections. You shall put the mercy seat upon the testimony, that's the ark of the testimony, in the most holy, and you shall set the table outside, look at that, set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. That's what I just showed you on the diagram. All right, so let me walk through this. So now we go back to Hebrews 9, a lot of back and forth here, I know. Um, and we go back to verse 4. So we are inside the most holy place, all right? Inside the most holy place. And notice that verse 4 says, in the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant. This is a little bit of a problem. Hebrews says, what I just read to you, says that you go into the holiest of all, which had the golden censer. If you, I'm going to ask you to go back to Exodus one more time, all right? If you go back to Exodus 30, turn there, all right? Exodus 30. And look at verse number 6 of Exodus 30. And this is talking about the altar of incense. And it says, and you shall put it before the veil, that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat, that is over the testimony, which I will meet with you. And then flip to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus 40 is the last chapter of Exodus. And look at verse 26. This is after this is how they're finally arranging the tabernacle. They're doing the they're actually doing the work now. He put the gold altar in the tabernacle of meeting, look at this, in front of the veil. All right. Now I know you have a map, but let me show you what we're talking about here. So you have this is the outer court. All right. Um, and then there is the, we'll just call it the holy place. Um and we have the showbread, and we have the golden candlestick. And then we have the most holy place, or the holy of holies. Hebrews says, look at Hebrews 9, 4, speaking of the holiest of all, which have the golden censer. So Hebrews says that the golden censer, also known as the altar of incense is here, but the two verses I just read to you from Exodus say that it is before the veil, which is a little bit of a problem, which is it, all right? The, the Pentateuch, that's when I say Pentateuch, that's what's in your notes. Pentateuch's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Pentateuch seems to say that the, all, the, the golden altar of incense is in the holy place, in front of the veil. Hebrews 9 says the holiest of all has the, look at it again, verse 4, it says, which has the golden censer. So I've got a little problem there. Which is it? Okay, and, and let me just, first of all, kind of talk about what happens here. At the, at the altar of incense, the incense has to, the, the coals have to be, had to be kept burning. And they would take a censer and they would fill the censer um, with the live coals and put incense on it so it would form a cloud. And it would form a cloud because when they were in here, the Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of God was. And you, you remember some of the stories about, remember the story about when David is moving the Ark of the Covenant and they put it on an ox cart instead of doing it the way they're supposed to, and the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah tried to touch it to, and struck dead. 
Uh, remember when the Ark of the Covenant was with the Philistines and they all got sick. And I mean, the Ark of the Covenant was, was what symbolized the presence of God. It was powerful. So you didn't mess with it. So the, the high priest would go in here once a year, but before he would go in, he would have to form a cloud with the incense. So it was right here and the Pentateuch seems to say that it was on this side of the veil when Hebrew seems to say it was on the other side of the veil. All right, so how do we reconcile that? Um, first of all, we acknowledge it, that it says that. Many people um, seem to think that what was outside the veil, um, or what was inside the veil, excuse me, was only the censer. All right. In other words, the altar of incense was here. The priest would carry the censer, get the live coals, get the incense, and carry the censer in. All right. That's how most have tried to reconcile. We're not going to spend a lot of time. Yes, Cindy. Okay. Yes. Um. I, I, it, it's not to serve the same purpose, but I would certainly say it would, it would probably in some fashion was made after that as a replica of that, but they would not believe that it forms a cloud so that they can be in the presence of God. They would, yeah, but but it, if that helps you kind of picture it, it might have been something like, I, I think the sensor, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I just know that the sensor would be carried in so that a cloud would form, so that they could actually do the ministry without feeling threatened by the presence of God, all right? So the, the point is, the, the best way to reconcile it, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here unless you have other questions, Hebrews and the Pentateuch say two different things. That's just all there is to it. We acknowledge it. Um, some people think it was a scribal error. You know, the scribe said something wrong, and that could have been. I think the easiest way to reconcile it is that the altar is here and they carry the censer with them in. And, and that, to me, makes the most sense. But do with that what you want. My point really is that the writer of Hebrews doesn't even deal with that um, because his intent here is not to get into this long discussion about all the details of the tabernacle. He's wanting to show us why that whole system didn't work. And the new system, the new covenant, and the great high priest does work. Now, there is, and I've already mentioned it, there is this special connection between the altar of incense and the holy of holies because the altar of incense provided the materials that would form a cloud that would allow the priest to minister inside the holy of holies. So I think the minister or the priest probably stopped at an altar that would be outside the veil, carried the censer in, which would fulfill Hebrews 9. The censer is inside the veil, and that is where he would do his, his ministry. All right. Turn to Leviticus 16, and we may only turn a couple of other places all morning. So if you're getting tired of turning, we're almost done. Leviticus 16, Day of Atonement. And we will pause here for just a, in just a minute for any questions or comments. Um, Leviticus 16, and look at verse number 12. Leviticus 16, verse 12. This is about the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. You've heard that term, Day of Atonement, all right? Um, and we are looking at Leviticus 16, verse 12. He shall make a censer full of burning coals of fire, from the altar, so he, he makes the censer with coals from the altar with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten, fine, and then he brings it inside. See, it says the same thing, and he brings it inside the veil. So I think Hebrews is just simply saying the censer goes in the veil, but he stops at the altar of incense. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, which is what I just said, lest he die. That cloud is necessary. He'll take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on his finger with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side 
and before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. He'll kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, and he'll make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. I actually read a verse further than I needed to. So this is the connection between the censer, the altar of incense, and the most holy place. So now he goes inside Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And I'm not going to get into this because, again, this, this is about the tabernacle, not the Day of Atonement. But this would be after he would have laid his hands on the scapegoat. There were two goats that day. One gets killed. One is the scapegoat. The sins are conferred on it, and that scapegoat is carried away. But now we're talking about what he does with the killed goat, okay, the, the, um, the executed goat that becomes the sacrifice. So now he goes in to the most holy place or the holy of holies, and look again at verse 4. The holy of holies has the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, it's overlaid with gold, and inside the Ark of the Covenant is the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, all right? The tablets that Moses would have taken from Mount Sinai. That one's pretty understandable. You get the tablets. What about Aaron's rod? In case you don't know this story, um, turn back one more time to the book of Numbers this time. Numbers 17. So inside, inside the Ark of the Covenant, which is here, this is the Ark of the Covenant, Inside that are the tablets of stone, Aaron's rod, and the pot of manna. All right? Read number 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Get from them a rod from each father's house, all their leaders, according to their father's houses, 12 rods. Write each man's name on the rod, and you'll write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. Place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony where I meet you. Shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you. They're saying, why is Aaron's family the only one that gets to do anything and lead and be priest? So God said, I'll show you. Everybody, every family gets a rod. Verse 6, Moses spoke to the children of Israel. Each of their leaders gave him a rod apiece for each leader according to their father's houses, 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness, and it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and yielded ripe almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord to all the children of Israel. They looked, and each one took his rod. And the Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me lest they die. And Moses did just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. So the children of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Surely we die, we perish, we all perish. Whenever, whoever even comes near the tabernacle, the Lord must die. So, so we shall, shall we all utterly die. So the point was to, to, to silence the rebellion. Everybody bring, every family, every tribe gets a rod, and the one that buds is the one that's in charge. He's the priest, and it was Aaron's rod that budded. And so God said, I want you to put that inside the Ark of the Testimony too, so that if anybody ever complains again, they can be reminded that God has an established authority system. So inside the Ark, There's the pot of manna, um, the tablets, and this rod that budded. Now, we're back on the notes, page two. This is where inside the most holy place at the Ark of the Covenant is where God promised to meet his people. Look at Exodus. It's in your notes. You don't have to turn there. Exodus 25, 22. There I will meet with you. 
and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, there's so much here. I'm going to give you some, I think, pretty rich typology here. There I will meet you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you about all, and I will give you in commandment, give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So the climax of the the climax of the tabernacle furniture is the Ark of the Covenant. And again, I am not an artist. Do not pretend to be. I'm just giving you where, where they're at. So there is what is called a mercy seat. We'll look at that in a moment. And on either side of the mercy seat, there are cherubim. Um, cherubim probably is the better way to pronounce it in the Hebrew. These are angelic. Um, they're overlaid with gold, and they sit on either side of the mercy seat, which is on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the most holy place. And the and I'll just go ahead and tell you now, the angels, if you read the description of how they're to be made, are looking in. They are looking in, down on the mercy seat. So let's go to the bottom of page two. So the climax of the tabernacle inventory is the covering of the ark. Go back to Hebrews 9. Let's read verse 5 now. Hebrews 9, 5. And above it, above the ark, were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak in detail. All right. Now, I think what he's saying is, well, what I said earlier, we could get into lots of typology, go on and on and on. But the writer of Hebrews has a point. His point isn't to dissect every point of type, typology. His point is, I want you to understand the old covenant is no longer good, and now it's the new covenant. So here is this. The, the cover of the ark was a golden slab. This golden slab is called the mercy seat. Um, the Greek word, if you were to look that up, um, Hebrews 9 Five mercy seat is the word hilasterion. I put it there in your notes. Hilasterion. Now, I'm going to ask you one more time. I think I said one more time earlier, but one more time. But you're not going to the Old Testament this time. You're going to Romans 3.25. All right. Now we're going to get into some really good theology here. Romans 3.25. Look at... Verse 25, actually start with verse 23. For all have sinned, we know that one, and fall short of the glory of God. Um, being freely justified, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who, be, who God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Committed. That word propitiation, Greek word, hilasterion. God set forth Jesus to be the mercy seat, to be the hilasterion, to be the, um, the covering. I'll show you that in just a moment. So the propitiation... So what did, what did that do? When God, let me just try to make this make sense. So when God looked at the mercy seat on the day of atonement, it appeased the wrath of God. Everybody understand that because God is holy, perfect, and righteous, he cannot be okay with sin. Does everybody understand that? It, it's not understood well in our culture because God is love, period. He's love. He's love. But because God is who he is, he cannot be okay with sin. And so there has to be an appeasement. The, the holiness of God requires that God be angry at sin, not the sinner, but angry at sin because he's angry at it because it separates us from him. So to appease that wrath, it's what propitiation and hilasterion mean, is there's, there's his mercy seat, and so 
they would put the blood there so that the wrath of God could be appeased for another year. He just overlooked it, the time being, for another year. That's what Romans 3 says. Now, flip over the page to page 3, and I want to read you this mercy seat language in the Old Testament. Again, it's, on the, it's in your notes, so you don't have to turn there. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half its length, cubit and a half its breadth, Two, you shall make two cherubim of gold, hammered work shall you make them, two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end, the other on the other end, of one piece with the mercy seat. Shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces toward one another, toward, look at this, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. That sounds like a lot of detail. Why in the world is that important? But you've got these two angels with their wings spread looking down at the mercy seat where God's wrath is appeased on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, when the priest takes the blood in. Now, the word, the two words mercy seat, look at the very top of page 3 there in that text in Exodus 25. That There's one Hebrew word for that, and it is... Kafaret, I put it in your notes. The Hebrew word is kafaret. Uh, kafar is a, a derivative of that. Genesis, you don't have to turn there. Okay, I can tell you this story. Genesis 6.14. God tells Noah to build an ark. How many know that story? Okay, we're all in the same. We know that story. All right, build an ark, and he says, I want you to... Uh, Pitch it on the inside and out, um, like put tar on it, all right? Um, I could put lots of tar on it, and it would have still leaked, and those eight people would have died. You understand? But, but Noah evidently knew how to do that. So he said, pitch it on the inside and out. Why did he do that? So it wouldn't leak. So there would be no perishing of the people on the boat. That pitching is the word kafar. It's a covering. Think about, please, please get this. This is really, I think, good stuff. What, what, what were the waters in the flood? What were those waters? They were a demonstration of the judgment of God. The sin had become so bad that God said, I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood. It's the judgment of God but God had a righteous man in his family that he put inside that ark to save, but to save them from the judgment waters, he had to pitch it. He had to kafar it inside and out. Otherwise, the judgment waters of God would have reached Noah and his wife, their three sons and their wives. So there had to be a, there had to be an atonement, not an atonement, there had to be a kafar, there had to be a, a covering. Otherwise, the judgment waters would have hit Noah and his family. That's what the mercy seat is. Do, do you understand? The mercy seat is the kafar. It is the kafarat. It is the propitiation. It is what, when God sees that, his judgment doesn't reach you and me. So the people for another year were okay because the wrath of God had been Kafard, it had been appeased, it had been covered. In New Testament, hilasterion, a propitiation had been made. All right, so that's what happened at the mercy seat. Now, the, that was the earthly counterpart. Think about all of Hebrews that we've studied. To the New Testament, Hebrews 4, come boldly now to the throne of grace. There's a veil that hides that. Only one guy once a year could even get in there. But when Jesus died, what happened to the veil? It got torn in two. So that we can now come boldly to the throne of grace because, and we'll get to it in a minute, because there is a heavenly sanctuary in which a greater blood has been placed, appeased the wrath of God once and for all. So now we can come boldly into God's presence and enjoy his presence today. But most Christians look for their fix on Sunday. We're old covenant Christians instead of daily coming into his presence. All right. 
presence of God dwelt between those cherubim. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, so let's look in the notes. I'm going to give you three Old Testament scriptures. I'll read them quickly. I don't really want to bog down here. We'll miss making the big point. All right, 1 Samuel 4.4. 4. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the Host. Look at this, who is enthroned on the cherubim. 2 Samuel 6.2, David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up the ark from there, the, from there, the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned, his presence, see, on the cherubim. Um, Psalm 80, verse 1, give O ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim. See, that's where God's presence was, Old Testament, on the mercy seat between the cherubim. This is my this is my favorite part of this lesson. Um, so now we get to the New Testament. It's in your notes, 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter's writing, and he's writing about salvation. And he says, now concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit in Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Now just stop there and look, look up for just a moment. What is Peter saying? He said, when the prophets of the Old Testament wrote, they tried to figure out who is this about. When Isaiah's writing, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. That was 700 years before Jesus. And Isaiah's saying, God, who is this for? Who is this about? He searched diligently and inquired when and who these things they were right. They didn't understand them. When they were predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories, they didn't understand to them. What was revealed to them, look back in the notes, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves. Isaiah wasn't going to get to see it. Jeremiah wasn't going to get to see it. They were serving not themselves, but you, Peter writes, you in the new covenant, in the things that you've not, that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Let me just stop. Peter said he was the prophets wrote that for you. For those of us who are now in the new covenant, this salvation that, that is ours, the good news, the gospel that came by the Holy Spirit that was sent from heaven. And that last line, I don't think is insignificant. Things that angels long to look into. Do you understand that angels don't know what it's like to be separated from God and restored? Angels don't know what it's like to be redeemed. They don't know what it's like to have fellowship with God that was once broken and is now back. They, they don't, angels don't understand, I, I believe this, why God even messes with us. They they are amazed that he would shed his blood. That they angels lived with the son in eternal in the eternal past, and they watched him as he became human and came and they watched as he died. They were dispatched to minister to him and stand with him. It's like, why are you doing this, God? They they don't understand it. They don't they don't have souls like we have. They weren't created in the image and likeness of God. Angels don't understand it. And these cherubim, I, I believe that God told Moses to make them stare down at the mercy seat as a picture. They don't get it. They long to look into it, and they're still longing to look into the sacrifice of Jesus, not fully grasping how God could love us so much that he would become flesh and die for us. I think that's the picture of these angels, the cherubim, looking into it. And then he says, we can't speak in great detail about this in verse 5. I said that I'd give you a minute. You may have questions. I'm going to get to the other five verses. They will go rather quickly. But any questions or comments about the sanctuary layout itself? Michael. Yes. Yeah, those are really those are really good questions. I, I don't I, I can't tell you. I don't know. There I are in the reading I missed something somewhere, but no, you didn't. And it's very similar to this issue. 
there, there is a little bit of a um, disparity, uh, disparity between what was commanded and what appears. Um, well, this one I understand because they had to keep the fire going. Right. It has to be outside. Right. And, and the sensor was... keep the fire going, but the only thing that can go inside... Yeah. Is that, well, this one makes sense. I don't know. I, I, I guess, I don't know if this is a good enough argument for you, but some would say that because not everything is mentioned doesn't mean that everything else wasn't in there. You know, so in Second Chronicles, when he's making that, even though it says the tablets go in there, it didn't, it doesn't say, but there was no pot of manna or no, you know, butted rod. So, an argument from absence doesn't necessarily mean th that would be that's probably the best way people would deal with that so the writer of hebrews seems to believe that that was still in there when he writes so okay now i don't i i'm careful with this because i don't want to shake people's faith too much all right i am perfectly comfortable with the writer of Hebrews being fully inspired, but being fully inspired to write the point that he's making does not necessarily mean that he knew all of the details of the Old Covenant perfectly well. And, and so I think it is possible that um, the writer of Hebrews, inspired of the Holy Spirit, was going from his understanding of the old covenant where the rod would have been in there and the manna when at some point it was removed, but he was only going from his knowledge. That does it to me. That does not lessen inspiration. No, some, I right. I think that is plausible. I just, some people think, Oh, he can't, it doesn't change inspiration to me at all. So I think that's possible as well. Okay. Yep. yep. Other questions or comments? Yes. Richard and then Bob. I have heard that, yes. That is no, it was certainly a miracle. Yes, absolutely. And the direction that it was ripped was, was miraculous as well, Bob. So he would know what he was like, right? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. I think the writer of Hebrews is so mesmerized by it himself that he says, I can't even speak anymore because it's so amazing. Yeah. To interpret Bob, that is a... <laughs> I, I think I'm going to defer to Rena. She's been doing that for years. <laughs> now, Bob was saying that, that he has, Bob was, thank you for giving me a moment. I love it when people hand things to me to say. That's beautiful. I love that. I live my life looking for people to tee things up for me, and you did it. Thank you. So, at Bob's expense, I love you, Bob, but nevertheless. Okay. So, Bob was talking about that he has read that there was a, a, a sense of an orb over where God dwelt. And um, when Moses spoke to him, the Bible says face to face, and knowing that he was created in the image and likeness of God, and knowing that he had had that encounter, but he said to God, I want to see you, because he wanted to know fully who he was as one created in the image and likeness of God. Rita, did I do okay? Interpreting Bob. Okay, there you go. So, all right. Let me um, let me run through these last verses. It'll really go very quick, I promise you. Um, 
and my promises, you know, haven't meant anything for 27 years. So why start now? All right, verse 6. Um, we're back to Hebrews 9, verse 6 and 7 now. So when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle. All right? Uh, performing the services. But the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. All right, so let me give you a quick contrast between the first and the second. The outer room, the first room, is where the ordinary priest would go, all right? Uh, that they would go there regularly, day by day, morning by morning, they would do several things. I'm, I'm not giving them all to you, but one of the things they would do would be trim the lampstand here. Every, these are just your normal priests. The lampstand would be out here, and they would trim that. You can read that in Exodus 27, 20, and 21. I won't read it to you. It just describes, this is part of the ongoing, the, the, the holy place. This first section was active all the time. Weekly, we already read this. They would change out the loaves in that first part. All right, that's Leviticus 24, 8, and 9. And then, I will read this to you, twice daily, they would make sacrifices. Uh, this is what you shall offer. I'm reading it to you from your notes. On the altar, two lambs, a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you'll offer in the morning. Other lamb you shall offer at twilight. The first lamb, a tenth measure of the flying fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil and a fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, shall offer with a grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning uh, for a pleasing aroma and a food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations. At the entrance of the tent of the meeting before the Lord, there I will meet with you and I will speak to you. There was also stuff that went on out here. There was a brazen, I think that might even be on your, um, I think it's in your, Yes, the brazen labor, the altar of sacrifice. There would be stuff that would go on out here. The labor is where they would wash before they would go in and perform their priestly duties. But this, this part here into the court um, was active all the time. That's the point that is being made. It was, it was ongoing, but the other point that's being made is it was repeated and constant. Look, look again at verse 6 and 7. Um, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing their services. It was, it was ongoing. But verse 7, but into the second part, this is the most holy place, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin that was committed in ignorance. So this only happened on the Day of Atonement. Watch this. And never could they enter without blood. And they had to offer blood for their own sins and for the sins of others. All right? We won't take time to read it, but you can read that in Leviticus 16, 31 through 34. Now, turn the page, last page of notes. Now, look at verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. All right? So before the coming of Christ, before his death on the cross, and as Richard mentioned, the splitting of the veil, even though all this activity was going on, there was no unhindered access to the presence of God. Once a year, one time, one man. Now, the reference to the Holy Spirit, I like that in verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this seems to be more than just inspiration of Scripture, but it seems to be that the claiming of the, that seems to be claiming that the Holy Spirit has given this author special revelation here. He's saying, let, let me, he's preaching a sermon, all right, or writing a letter, and he's saying, even though we talked about one man going into here once a year, the Holy Spirit, the author is saying, is telling me that really access into the holiest place 
was not available. It really wasn't available under the first tabernacle. I want you to look at verse 8. I don't want to split hairs, but this to me is pretty exciting. Look at verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest. Now, the New King James says, while the first tabernacle was still standing. The English Standard Version, and I put it in your notes, says, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. To me, that's really significant, and I think that's a great translation because here's what the author is saying. Look at this first part. Remember I told you this is busy. This is active. There's sacrifices every day. There's, you know, there's a morning sacrifice. There's an evening sacrifice. There's washings going on. Here's what the author is saying. As long as as daily ritual cleansing was necessary, there was no real access to God. Um, Once a year, one man, one time for a few minutes was no, no real proof that access into God's presence has been gained. In other words, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was the exception, not the rule because there's still stuff going on. They had to make sacrifices every day. They had to cleanse. They had to, families, every time they sinned, had to bring another offering. And I mean, just all this going on, on and on. And so he said, the very fact that this is still standing indicates that, that access into the presence of God had not yet been gained. This is not insignificant. For the first room, I would say, is a, a spatial metaphor for the present time and its inadequacy. Look at verse 9 and 10, and I'll be done. It was symbolic, the first. The first section, New King James says tabernacle, but the ESV says the first section. That first section was symbolic for the present time, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Let me try to make this make sense in about 60 seconds, all right? This present time, it's symbolic for the present time. He is writing, I believe, to Hebrews, Christians, Jewish Christians, um, Some of their friends, some of their family members are still going through the motions. He's before 70 AD, before the temple is destroyed. And he's saying as long as people are still going back there, as long as people still think that's their access, just like it was in the old covenant, as long as they're still abiding by the old rituals, hanging on to them, no true access to God has really been made available or found to be experienced. There's no need to repeat the sacrifices that Jesus made. They are once and for all. Um, We don't have to, aren't you glad we don't have to kill an animal every time we sin now? Um, That's the whole point. As long as this is still going on, then you're not really experiencing this. And let me make the application, and I do need to quit. Um, And I think I'll go back to what I said. Old covenant, new covenant Christians today in 2022 are mostly living like old covenant Christians because we still, we just still go back and we never enjoy, we never live in the blessings of what Jesus did once and for all. We just got to keep starting over. and, and, And I'm not... I'm, no way am I whitewashing sin. The Bible says we are to confess our sin. We don't have to kill an animal. You don't have to wait for Sunday. If you fail on Monday, Jesus, forgive me and cleanse me. Don't let access start and stop with Jesus. It doesn't have to. Because as, but as long as you've got that outside tabernacle standing where you think you've got to, and, and again, I would say to the Catholics, they think they've got to do penance and they've got to you know, go back to the priest again. They still got that veil standing there. It's God. But as long as you leave it there, you don't have unhindered access to God.